Hi, my name is Nick Petrozzoli. I'm a third year PT student at Elon University. And today I'm going to be talking about an article by Malvi et al. Uh, titled Transcutaneous Electrical Nerve Stimulation for Phantom Pain and Stump Pain in Adult Amputees. Uh, the level of evidence was a 3C, and the target population was amputees uh, for at least one year that had phantom limb pain or residual limb pain in uh, their amputation leg. And then also the inclusion criteria was having a pain rating on the MPRS of 3 out of 10 uh, or more. And then also um, that they used, this patient had to have used their prosthesis at least two times a week, two days a week, or at least two hours. Exclusion criteria was any change in medications, uh, pain medications, within three days before the treatment day, and then also any uh, contraindications to TAN, so uh, also excluded from the research. So listed up on the screen are the specific electrotherapy parameters. And the way that uh, placement for electrodes were determined was simply by palpating the limb. So um, for all these patients, they're all uh, transtibial amputations. And what they would do is they would palpate and talk to the patient and say, is this where you're getting that same pain? That's uh, while you're at rest or while you're doing a specific movement. And based off of what they said, they were able to determine where the best placement of the electrodes would be. So if I was talking to my patient and he said, you know, my, I'm having the greatest amount of pain when you're pressing right here, I would see where it would go most proximally, and I'd place it there. And then I would also just go a little bit further down that into that radi uh, where that pain would radiate, and then also place it down here. Now, there was two patients that had um, tactile allodynia, and what they did for them is they would put the electrodes on the side of where that very sensitive skin tissue was. So where they would go is they'd keep palpating until they would say, you know, I'm not, if I'm not a sensitive there, I feel fine, and they would place it on those two sides right there. Um, for one patient, they were not able to palpate to get a, a best idea of where they should put the electrodes. So what they did was a trial and error, and all they did was they would take the electrodes, and based off of the information they said, you know, it kind of feels like going down the side of my leg or the inside of my leg. They would place the electrodes there, and then they'd set up the parameters, turn it on, see if it got that strong but comfortable stimulation that they were looking for. So let's say uh, they, they thought it may be here. They could place it here, and then a little bit further down. And then they hook them up, put the parameters in, and see if they got that sensation that they were looking for. So let's pretend that my patient, after a while, I figured out where the best spot was. Um, and for the one patient that this did occur, it only took 15 minutes for them to figure this out, which spot was the best placement. So um, for my patient here, um, I, this is the optimal place to put the electrodes. And I set up the parameters. And before I got it started, I would ask them, OK, so on the scale from 0 to 10, um, where would you say your pain is right now just sitting here at rest? And then they would give, you, give me a score, recorded that, and then they also asked them, what's the most painful movement that you do that brings about that residual limb pain or um, phantom limb pain? And they would record that as well. So then once they figured that out, they set the parameters, had it started, the patient would sit there at 30 minutes, they assessed again at rest and with activity, and they did it again at 60 minutes, and then they finished the treatment. So what were the results of the study? Uh, they found no adverse events that occurred. Uh, skin irritation was not a factor. Uh, if there was any redness, it went away after five minutes. So that was a very good outcome. Um, There's also a decrease in pain in both groups, both statistically significant. However, it was only clinically significant in the movement that they did. So when they were resting, uh, 
the reduction of pain just sitting there reduced to about 1.7 at 30 minutes on average, and then it reduced to 1.8 at 60 minutes. So not um, at 2 or above uh, in reduction of pain. That would be clinically significant. But with that movement uh, that created the most amount of pain for them um, was reduced to 2.8 on average at 30 minutes and 3.9 at 60 minutes. So that's clinically significant. So what does this tell me clinically? Um, with this uh, research, what this tells me, um, not necessarily what does this do afterwards for a patient that's continually having residual limb pain. I wouldn't say that because all they looked at was for 60 minutes how this affected the patient. So I would say if I'm working with a patient and I'm trying to do a therapeutic exercise and they're really limited to, to do this exercise because of the pain that they're having. And I've looked at um, you know, the biomechanics of this activity, you know, the strength deficits, you know, the more common things that, that might mess, mess up or cause this, this pain to occur with this movement. I might not necessarily go to this right away since the level of evidence is a 3C and there was no control group to compare it to. But if I've tried a few different things and it doesn't seem to work, this is something that I might use uh, just as uh, something to try out just to see if I could help reduce that pain. And even if it is just a placebo effect of reducing that pain for the patient, I'm still able to get them to do that movement, that therapeutic movement that will really help them out. So I think that's where this could be a valuable, valuable um, treatment approach for a patient uh, that would fall under this demographic.